Javon Woodman is a leader. He's a decision maker. He's a man with a keen instinct to surround himself with people and fit the right people in the right slots to get a job done that needs to be done in a massive organization as this one is. I've worked with Devon for the past four, five years. When he took the responsibility of president in 1979, he literally had an impossible job to do. He took an organization that had impossible financial yokes attached to it. He turned it around and he corrected the situation step by step. It wasn't an easy job to do, but it took a leader with his caliber to get that job done. He's a farmer from Idaho. Devon spent his entire life farming and ranching. He resides presently in a fourth, on a fourth generation farm in Blackfoot, Idaho, near Blackfoot, with his wife, Dean, and nine children. They operate 400 acres of diversified uh, farming, including wheat, they produce hay, potatoes, and they've got a cow-calf operation. Every bit of his production that he produces goes through the NFO channels. Since joining the NFO in 1968, Devon has served as county president of Bingham County. He served as district president. He served as a state president of Idaho, national director from Idaho for four years, and as national vice president of NFO from 1971 to 1979. Yvonne assumed the responsibilities as president when Orly stepped down. He served in positions as district field representative, regional supervisor, executive assistant for the Western States and the field staff department, and as a special assistant to the president of this organization. Devon was destined for leadership when he was in the service with the Army in Fort Ord. He wrote and pioneered the art of leadership development and management, a course that is designed for officer candidates. And after he designed the program, his commanding officer asked him to stay on and teach the course. That course is now a prerequisite requisite for all officer candidates. And I'm proud to introduce to you your president of the National Farmers Organization, Devon Woodland. Thank you very much. Bob, where did you find all that information? You told my wife things that she didn't even know. <laughs> it's good to be here tonight. I think it's a real tribute to the organization to see this crowd assembled here with the inclement weather that we have been combating all week. It's a real tribute to you and to this organization, people. I've been in a lot of meetings that would have been less attended for less reason than what you had for weathering the storm and being here. I want you to know that my business is farming and ranching. That's what I understand best, what I enjoy most. I want you to know that I can relate to agriculture producers because I take pride in being one. 
I dairied nearly all my life. And I sold my dairy herd of 50 cows in 1971. And my wife often told me the first mistake she can remember of make, making after our marriage was milking those cows the first night I didn't come home. <laughs> I can recall as a youngster milking cows before and after school. We didn't stay after school to play football or basketball. If we had any activity, we'd done it during the noon hour because chores came first. I can remember the milking machine that my father purchased after I returned from the service in about 1954, 55. And I thought my problems were solved. And as I bought that herd and that ranch and another one or two, I began to realize that all my problems weren't solved by a milking machine. I can relate to cattle because I now have a cow-calf operation. We weaned our calves eight months at 523 pounds. A week ago, this coming Friday, the three boys that are here and I, we dehorned and worked cattle all day long. Two weeks ago today, we left the high country and trailed for three days, one of them which was in rain from 5 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock that night. We trailed averaging 35 miles a day at two and a half miles an hour. I can relate to grain producers because I understand grain. Our harvested wheat this year averaged 127 bushel per acre, irrigated wheat. There's one department that I have a little tough time relating to in that specialties. The only thing I can think of to relate to specialties is sunflowers, and what I remember of sunflowers as a kid I don't like. <laughs> I don't like to spend a lot of time re uh, reminiscing. But I want to go back with you a little while this evening and then let's walk forward. And I want you to know how important you are to this convention, how important you are to the success. You are the National Farmers Organization. When I was asked to rescue this organization in 1979, I didn't know for sure what that challenge was going to consist of. And it was a matter of just a few days that I began to realize the seriousness of that challenge and that responsibility in which I had been asked to participate in. 1979, in a matter of a few days, I realized the challenge that was there. One of the first responsibilities, and I appreciate the banking relationship we have here with us tonight, and it's been here all day and probably be here tomorrow with us. That relationship that we have with the banking structure that we're doing business with today is good. It's excellent. And they value us as a customer. And that hasn't always been the case. Because I remember in 1978 and 1979, my first responsibility was go to the banking community that we were doing business with and try to talk them out of closing out our loans, reducing, if not eliminating us, as a customer. And as I sat and talked to them at a board table, I swear, was as long as this one, and I sat on one side and five of them sat on the other, it was pretty lonely. And I asked them for 90 days to turn this organization around. And their response was, what makes you think that we think you can do it? And I said, you'll never know if you don't give me a chance. And they said at that point, you have 90 days. 90 days to prove to them that we could change the direction that we had been going and give them that assurance that we would continue on a progressively solid ground and footing. 
I came back to the office, and in a matter of 48 hours, I learned that the federal government had filed a lien against this organization in the courthouse in Adams County, Iowa for several hundred thousand dollars because we had taken the federal and state taxes from the payrolls of our employees and had spent it. And we were delinquent with the federal government. And they had filed a lien on us. And our fear was that two more creditors would file a similar lien and force us into bankruptcy. The telephone switch box never quit ringing. And the operator there who handled the calls became almost a nervous wreck because nobody wanted to take the calls and deal with the issue. And I had those calls channeled into one person that I sat almost daily with, and we worked out an arrangement where we could calm the fears of those creditors who had put us on a cash basis. We couldn't buy stamps for the postage machine. We couldn't print the reporter. We had to send the check to the printer. We had taken the Blue Cross Blue Shield money from our premiums from the employees and spent that and they thought they had insurance and had been spent. That's what we were faced with. I'll tell you people, it was a dark, dark day when I began to realize where I stood and what that job consisted of. Well, I want you to know that those problems have been dealt with. And they have been solved. And today I'm happy that our credit people are here with us. And that relationship that we now have to work with through them is good. I'll tell you how tough it is. You take a nonprofit organization that's not supposed to make any money and you maintain a staff and a structure, department programs, and pay off hundreds of thousands of dollars in bad debts, and you got your hands full. Now, we haven't solved all of our problems, but I'll guarantee you we got them in a manageable position. It became a very critical period of time in the organization because commodity movement had slowed to almost an all-time low. And because of that, the revenues generated through the sale of commodities coming into the organization had dipped to an all-time low. We had had meetings the years before and during that period of time, and we couldn't even get you to come to a meeting because for the last two years prior to that time, every time you came, we ask you to bring your checkbook. You remember it as I do, and I never enjoyed one of them. But I went out on those meetings in the crisis atmosphere because I was told as you the doors were about to close. And they were, and we weren't kidding. We had to go out and hold what we called then many conventions so that we could start the interest in the organization moving again. And for three weeks, we traveled from the east to the west, the north and the south, and held meetings. And it's the first time you came to a meeting in years that you weren't asked to bring your checkbook. And every time we tried to explain to you not to worry about it, we could see you begin to draw back because you had the same fear. You were embarrassed. And you refused to go out and talk to your neighbor. And you certainly wouldn't invite him to a meeting with you. And so that's the type of atmosphere that we were operating under. It was a difficult time. I had to make a choice as to how to deal with the issue, and I had three choices I could make. And we settled on one. First of all, the easy solution would have been to increase volume of commodities. The attitude and atmosphere in the organization was not of such, but that was compatible with the thinking of the membership. Second. We could have increased the checkoff on the commodity moving through the organization. That certainly would have slowed the movement of commodity. And that wasn't compatible. The other was that we could bring costs in line with expenses. And this means when you deal with an organization who finds itself in a financial difficulty, 
you look at all areas of that organization that are not contributing to the cash flow. And this is where you begin to feel the effects of what we had to deal with. You saw programs begin to be pulled back. You saw staff begin to be reduced in numbers. We had no choice, and it was a painful experience for you. But I want to assure you today that we're ready to move forward and renew that effort, that vigor, that vitality that must be. We're ready to move forward again with those needed elements and needed parts of this organization. It won't come quick, and it must only come as capital will allow that to happen. Well, where do we stand today? We have reserved some monies for growth. We have reserved some monies for programs. We have budgeted and put our departments on a very strict budget where they have authority, but they also have responsibility. And they must account for the monies in, the monies out from their department. And it was not an easy transition for them to go through. And I saw one department after another almost collapse because of fatigue, emotional strain, because they, for the first time, was facing that responsibility of money management. We have reserved some monies for growth. And we don't believe, barring any unforeseen needs at this time, that we'll have to increase our borrowed capital. We think we have it in a pretty good, manageable position. Now, you must also be willing to take a risk, be willing to take a chance. And if you ever get in a position where you're not willing to do that, then you will wither, you will stagnate. But that chance must have some reasonable chance of succeeding and not be reckless in that risk that you're willing and feel that you must and might take. Let me give you just a little bit of information that I think would be of interest to you. We've established a good working relationship with the Omaha National Bank. Rick is here. We do most of our NFO Inc. business, operations business there. And you have introduced the gentleman this afternoon that we do most of our business as far as the trust is concerned with out of St. Louis the International Telephone and Telegraph Company. And our relationship with them is excellent. And we are considered by them one of their largest accounts in that region and that area. We have modernized in some areas within the organization carefully, not carelessly, but we have automated some of the programs and some of the workload that heretofore we had been doing manually. We find ourselves now automated in the cash receipts, the budget process. We have installed word processors within the organization, and we have called the typewriters obsolete. The word processing system has a memory and storage capacity that you can take and pull off from documents, letters written, corrections. <coughs> we certainly haven't been moving slowly in the areas of growth that were important to this organization. Let me give you some statistics on some of the payouts and payoffs that we have taken care of and yet to deal with. The 4 and 8 percent notes that you're familiar with. In 1979, we had 199, no, we had $399,000 of those that we owed you, that were in many cases delinquent principal and interest. We have been able to reduce that down from 399,000 to 170,000. And our goal is to bring that on down to a zero balance. The one third of 1%, monies that you should have been paid back in 1977, 78, and 79, the one third of 1% that had been collected from the proceeds of sales we had held within the organization prior to my administration, and we had spent it. And we owed you $199,000 that should have been in the one-third of 1% and paid out to you. 
Today that stands at zero. We have paid that back to the membership of this organization. The advances from the trust in 1977-79 when I became involved was over a million dollars. Advances from the trust. Today that advance on work in process, it will be explained tomorrow in detail, is reduced from over a million dollars down to 426,000. And we intend to move that on down even farther. The interest payable, we were paying $119,000 of interest. In 1978, 79, when I became involved, in 1983, we paid $44,000 in interest, and the interest rate has almost doubled since that period of time in 79. Well, these are some of the things. Our current status, as far as accounts payable, in 1979, we had 45% of our accounts payable current. Today, we have 93% of them current. Over 90 days, in 1979, we had 46% delinquent. Over 90 days, today, we have 1%. Now, people, I'll tell you, it hasn't been easy. And sometimes I get credit for things others do. But I'll tell you who made it happen. It's these people you see here in front of you, the department. <coughs> the staff, the board of directors. They took that responsibility seriously, and they performed. And there will be further reduction in exposure. There will be further reduction in other programs that we feel need and must be dealt with in a way that we can hold our heads high. That's where we're at today. That's where we came from. Where are we going tomorrow? Before I tell you where we're going tomorrow, I want to talk to you about some things that would relate to you and your farming operation as it does mine. I had the opportunity not too long ago of meeting in several national meetings. And I want to tell you where agriculture is and where it's headed as the planners consider its future, which would be yours and mine. I sit in a World Congress on Agriculture Credit. And in there, there were 28 foreign countries. I spoke briefly of that this afternoon. We had seven interpreters. The chairman was a Frenchman. This gentleman was knowledgeable of his country's agriculture, and he was also knowledgeable of the agriculture in this country. One of the questions he asked, of Governor Wilkinson, because the others on that panel had left. And I'm speaking of the secretary and some of the undersecretaries and some other members of the department. They left the governor there to hold the bag and answer the hard questions. And he handled them well. But they said to him, we know that the United States is a major producer of agriculture goods. We know that we and the European countries, the third world countries, are major importers of agriculture goods. This means our relationship will be continued for some time. What are you doing to preserve agriculture into the family farm structure? What are you doing to make it possible for young people to get involved in agriculture and agriculture production? Or someday, are we going to be buying from major corporations in this country and the world? They recognized the trend. And as I sat for three days and listened to those discussions, it became apparent to me that those people from those countries understood the need of agriculture, agriculture producers, better than our own government. We had a stronger and a greater ally in the foreign countries of the world than we do in this country. They recognized that agriculture was being underpaid. They recognized that it was a vital industry to their country. 
but they also recognized their only ability to assist in the dilemma would be to offer more credit and that that should only be a temporary thing and not a permanent solution. Where are our friends? I think as you look around, you better consider the man sitting to you as your prime friend. About two months ago, I issued some releases, being somewhat critical of the secretary. About a month after they had been out and circulated, I got a call from the department. The secretary called and wanted to visit. I knew what he wanted to visit about. He wanted to know what the problem was. I didn't take the call. About two weeks later, he called again. I took it. He said, well, he said, you know, I understand that you have been issuing some press releases critical of the department. What's your problem? I said, Mr. Secretary, it's very simple. We have a philosophical difference of opinion. You believe that this major adjustment agriculture is going through means that more farmers and ranchers must go out of business. And I disagree. Your department says that there must be 396,000 more farm units liquidated. You say that 16% more of the farmers must go, and I disagree. Philosophical difference. Well, he says they're going to go regardless of what you and I think. It's just going to happen. And I said, it's not going to happen because of any fault of theirs. It's going to happen because of programs that they have been misled on from your department. You've called them inefficient. You've called them marginal farmers. Those people have been gone long ago. Their only problem is inability to represent their needs at the marketplace. That's their problem. They're not inefficient. They're not marginal. I said, Mr. Secretary, you can't sell your hogs at 34 cents and stay in business. I said, you can't sell your corn at $2 and stay in business. He says, no, that's right. I can't. And I said, you've been expecting these people to do that. Now, I said, you may stay in business a year longer than them because you have more capital to work with. But at some point, you can't stay in business under those programs. No, he said, that's right, I can't. I said, I disagree with your FHA program. You've turned it into a commercial bank. We know the funds are there. You tell us the funds are there. And you're only going to loan them to a low-risk borrower. You're not going to take any chances. And if you think they can't repay on schedule, the monies aren't going to be made available to them. They're in a high-risk atmosphere and you're going to have to place the department in a high-risk situation with them. Well, he says, we have made a lot of loans and we think they've been high-risk. I said, you're going to have to make some more. You're going to have to make some more. You're responsible for agriculture markets to some degree. The government negotiates the international trade agreements and those international trade agreements have a direct reflection on markets. The embargo the estimates, the projections on supply, they all have an impact on agriculture markets. And you have to assume some degree of responsibility. I said another point. The administration keeps assuring the American people they're going to keep food cheap. And I think it's time you tell the American people they're going to have to pay more for food. Well, he said, you know, that may be true. We may have to start telling them that. But you know, when they pay more for that food, we want farmers to get the money. We want them to get the money. And I said, Mr. Secretary, <laughs> I said, Mr. Secretary, that's our responsibility. That's our goal. That's our purpose. That's what the intent of the National Farmers Organization is. Well, he says, you've put your shoulder to the wheel on that one. I said, yes, and it won't come quick and it won't come easy. Well, he said, don't close the door. He said, when you come in, come see me. Let's talk about it. I said, I certainly will. And so we parted on that refrain. But you have to understand what's being told to you. And that is that 16% of you won't be here next year. And sometimes you look at the convention and you remember when you had 10, 15, 20,000. 
I remember when we had six million farmers. Today we got less than three. And as you and I sit here with 4,000 approximately, hopefully the numbers will continue to build to that, that's equivalent to 10,000 because our numbers are more than cut in half. The representation that we have in volume is still strong. And someone will continually say to me in a press conference, how many members have you got? I think they get a kick out of asking that question and wonder what I'm going to say. It's a very simple answer. We haven't got enough. Then they say, well, the major farm, other major farm organizations talk about their numbers. I said, yes, I know that well. I know one that talks about Cook County in Illinois, and that's Chicago. There's not a farmer in it, and that's their biggest membership. <laughs> one of the goals I had as president of this organization was to attempt to pull farm organizations closer together. If you remember four years ago, I told you that we would meet at some point and agree on issues we could publicly.